thank you, Rod, and thank you, everybody. Um, it really is a privilege to be able to present this morning. Um, I've had the opportunity, like Rod said, to do my PhD, to do a series of research projects the last few years. So I get to share, hopefully, a glimpse of that today. While I'm not quite finished, this will have to be part one. So part two we'll have to do at a later time. But I think you'll see a, a nice little thread here. So thank you for this opportunity. So no conflicts, pretty straightforward here. So I wanted to start with this photo here. And I thought it was kind of a classic image of what we do in research. It's what we do in the clinical world. It's what we do probably too often in real life. So we look at something, and I just picture these two guys. Six, nine, six, nine. And it's so easy to get so caught up in, well, this is what I see. I've seen this image a number of times. I've seen it my whole life. Clearly, that's a six. And the other guy says, no, I've seen this my whole life. This is clearly a nine. So I just want to challenge us to sometimes, we're not, we are right, but we're not completely right. So neither one of these guys is wrong, but neither one's exactly right. So sometimes we just need to be willing to see things from another perspective. I think in research, you can often do this. You can make uh, assumptions about the results, but you really need to look back at the methods. And I think in the clinic we do this, and I've seen this a million times, this must be what it is. It must be a grade one ankle sprain. But then it doesn't quite respond well, so we need to see things differently. So you'll see this thread throughout. Agenda today. First, we're going to talk about ankle injuries. Spoiler alert, they may not happen as we once thought they would do. We're going to talk about shoulders. So shoulders are now an overuse uh, complaint that a lot of volleyball players have. We're going to talk about how you can monitor, how you could screen that. And then we're going to talk about knee injuries. So with all the jumping they do, it's another overuse injury. They get a lot of patellar tendon symptoms. So how can we measure this, and is it a valid met kind of method to measure? So this is the Catcher National Volleyball Team from two summers ago. I've had the privilege to work with these guys the last few years, and they're a great group of guys. I love these guys. Um, but I put this up there because throughout my research, one of the things that I've wanted to do is make it very clinically relevant. So it drives me crazy when we do research and how do I apply that to my team. So really, through all of my projects, I really want the take home message to be, this is something that you can take and you can apply with your guys right now. So whether you're a volleyball uh, physio or doctor, or whether you work with football or athletics, you've got something hopefully after this lecture to take back to your team as well. So we're going to start off challenging our brain for a moment. So just think to yourself, what is it that you see in this picture? If I had to summarize this, it looks like some sort of black and white image with some gray tones. There's some sort of spirals that start outside and they go to some point in the middle of the picture. So. We could just take that and move on to the volleyball slides, get back to the interesting stuff. But if we follow one of these spirals, so we pick, put a red dot at the top here, and let's go ahead and follow the spiral and see where it ends up. OK, that, that, might, that must not have been right. Let's try that again. So a little bit farther in here. So and clearly, I'm playing with your brain a little bit. These are not spirals. It's just a set of circles. Some are bigger than others, and they go to small circles in the middle. So again. It's not quite what you think you see. So the first study we did, we did a series of video analysis um, looking at ankle injuries in the highest level of volleyball players. So these are national team players that got injured during the Olympics, during the World Championships, World League Games. So these are your top players in the world. And what we found, so some previous research by one of our previous colleagues, Tuna Bure, found that most ankle injuries, most injuries in volleyball happen at the ankle. So about one in four injuries are ankle injuries. And this is data from the International Volleyball Federation from their injury surveillance system. So we took those injuries that happened at the ankle and we requested video of all those injuries. So out of 32 time loss ankle injuries, we got video for 27 of them. Unfortunately, three of them did not show the injuries. So it left us with 24 videos to analyze. So some might ask, why would you do video analysis? We already know how these injuries happen. And to some extent, you're right. So through questionnaire data, we know that ankle sprains likely happen secondary to contact at the net. So two players are playing a ball near the net. There's some sort of collision. One guy lands on another, and that's how these things happen. However, injuries happen very quickly. And we know from other situations, things like eyewitness testimony, that people think they know what they saw, and they're confident of it. But when we actually trace it back, often what they remember isn't exactly what happened. So that's the reason to do video analysis, because we can't quite trust the reliability of this data. So really, if we want to fully understand how these ankle injuries take place, we need to describe them with good, accurate, specific details. So we looked at two things. One, 
we looked at the playing situation. So this is the volleyball perspective. What's going on? Was the guy blocking? Was he hitting? Was he in the front row? And then we looked at the specific injury mechanism. So at the ankle joint itself, what was the ankle doing? Or what were the other joints doing? So we had five experts come together. And this study was done over three stages. One, we had to define the actual video frame where the injury happened. So we defined that. And we used this definition of the first frame in which an abnormally large movement occurred outside of the expected normal range of physiologic motion. So it's a lot of wording just to say the one frame where you see the large movement that you would not expect the ankle to move in that, into that position. So then each reviewer completed 24 cases. It was a series of four or five pages. Put that data together and then where we could, the experts came to a consensus and we could make decisions on that. Other areas where there's no consensus, we had to deem that unclear. So these two categories, what did, what did we assess? So playing situation, again, offense, defense, were you in the front row or the back row? What were you doing? Were you blocking, attacking? Did you land on a teammate? Did you land on an opponent? In the injury, we looked at the joint position, the ankle, knee, the hip. We looked at the joint movements, what happened during these injuries. Other things, the position of the arms, were you reaching? Were you landing on one foot? Were you landing in two feet? So just a whole set of variables. And then what did we find? So in volleyball, maybe not a surprise for those of you that work in the sport, that most injuries happen while blocking. Additionally, there was this other subset of injuries that happen while attacking. And again, we'd probably expect that, but I think as we dig into it, we find some interesting things. So I'm going to show you a video here. This is one of our videos. Um, this is pretty much, if you remember one video, this is a classic ankle sprain in volleyball. This is the most common way that this happens. So what you're going to see, you're going to see one of the players here in red is going to be trying to block the ball. She's going to be blocking one of the players that's hitting from out here. And I'll let the video play, and you'll see the injury happen from a couple different angles. So right there, and we'll see it a little better here. Again. So that's the ankle. You'll see here she's drifting from one side to the other. So she lands with all her weight on one foot. So, that, so that's common injury in volleyball. So what's kind of happening here? So if you look at this top left photo, what we see is the girl that was hitting the ball, the woman that was hitting the ball, lands. You can see the white center line. So she lands on the white center line, but actually a little bit into the blocker side of the court. So what happens is that player lands, the blocker who's now tried to time her block, tried to block, she comes down and there's a girl's foot underneath her. So there's really nothing that she can do here. You're going to land on this foot, and you just hope that it's not a big injury. But what you see is her foot's initially plantar flexed. And as we progress through this, you'll see her foot come down to this, what we're calling a foot flat position. So it comes down until it makes contact with the ground. So the foot is flat here. And then when there's nowhere else to go, it takes the path of least resistance. And you get this rapid inversion moment. So we touched on, I talked about the girl landing on the center line. And one of the things that we did is we wanted to see is what's going on. Is this happening in all the cases or just some of them? So we found that in these situations where two players land under the net, in every situation, the girl or the guy that was hitting the ball landed on the center line. Comparatively, the blocker only landed on the center line in about half the situations. Now that may not be a problem in itself, but when we look further, so what we saw is the attacker not only landed on the center line, but they also landed partially into the opposing court again, in almost every situation. However, the blockers rarely land into the opponent's court. So based on this, if we had to kind of say, which player do we blame? Who's at fault? Well, with this data, we would say, well, the attacking player is probably the one to blame. But that can be for a various number of reasons. So that's part of the sport. The set could have been a little tight. Maybe the attacking player just jumped, had a bad jump, and they landed where they shouldn't. So that's a common situation we see. And with volleyball, you are allowed to land on that white line. You're even allowed to land beyond it, as long as you still have part of your foot in contact with the line or over the line. So in these situations, we did not have any violations. So these are all legal plays in volleyball. So again, when we see the breakdown of these jumps, we talked about the blocking situations. Additionally, and we didn't describe it, but you can land on one of your teammates. So it's very common. You'll have two or three people jumping up, blocking at the same time. And it does happen where you land on the person next to you. But the one that was probably most surprising to us is this group of attacking injuries, attacking out of the back row. 
So in volleyball, just to give a synopsis, you've got six players on the court, and what you see is you've got these three players that play up at the net. So these are your front row players. They can jump, they can play at the net, they can spike the ball anytime, anywhere they want. However, the three players in the back row, so these two and the one serving, are not allowed to play the ball at the net. Well, they're not allowed to spike. So what they need to do is they need to jump from behind, what you'll see here, this white line. So if they jump from behind the white line, they can basically become a fourth player in the offense, which gives a tremendous advantage against the three blockers for the other team. So in this video, you're going to see uh, this white team is going to serve the ball, this team is going to hit it back over, and then you're going to see one of the players who's going to jump from about here in the middle of the court, and you're going to see her land on one of her teammates. So we'll let this play out. So get ready, here comes the injury. So it's not fun to see, but it's very clear what's happening here. So again, this was one of the surprising injuries to us because it's always in the back of your mind that this can happen, but really this is a controllable situation. So the girl in the front is trying to cover the block. She's trying to do what she's supposed to do, but clearly there's some sort of lack of awareness or lack of communication, and so you've got two players colliding on the same side where they probably shouldn't be. So this happened quite a few times and is something certainly to be aware of. So specifically what happened in kind of the injury mechanisms. So we found, not a surprise, most of these ankle injuries, they're inversion injuries. We also found from when they first make contact to where the injury actually takes place, most of the ankles move toward dorsiflexion. So we'll elaborate on this a little bit. So again, if you think of two positions, so one frame we've got the where you first make contact either with the ground or with your opponent's shoe or your teammate's shoe. And then we've got the injury frame where the actual injury took place, so where you had the sprain. How you get there is how your joint moves from one to the next. So again, if we go back to this first situation, we find that initially, and you can see it in this picture, the girl's ankle is plantar flexed. So it's plantar flexed and it's in a relatively neutral inversion eversion position. If we follow, the, follow these images through, you'll see, as I mentioned earlier, that the ankle begins to dorsiflex until it gets to a foot flat position. Again, doesn't have anywhere to go. You get this rapid inversion moment. And so in the end, you've got this inversion moment, this inverted position, with the absence of any substantial plantar flexion. And this, we're not the first to find this, but this is something that's been shown in a couple other studies. It's been shown in some analysis of tennis uh, ankle sprains. Um, they found in accidental injuries that have taken place in the lab. So for us, I think back when I was initially taught, I was taught that, oh, an inversion ankle sprain, you plantar flex the ankle and then you invert it. But we're finding that that's not quite accurate. So in these situations where you've got a landing-related injury, we're finding that in volleyball, there's no significant plantar flexion in most of these cases. So what do we find? Most injuries happen while blocking. The attacking player often lands underneath the net and they're the one that kind of creates this problem. The back row player often lands on a front row teammate, and that's surprising how common that is. And then finally, you get this rapid inversion moment without a significant amount of plantar flexion. So brain teaser number two. So again, what do you see here? First glance, some sort of black and white checkerboard. There's some sort of green cylinder here, and it looks like there's probably a light source on the right side of the screen that seems to cast a shadow across the board. That pretty fair, pretty clear, no major objections to that. If we look at block A, we see that seems to be one of these black colored checkered boxes, and B is one of these white colored ones. But again, if we look a little closer, I'm gonna take a few squares away, and it becomes clear that A and B are actually the exact same color. So if we go back, they look black and white. I promise you they're actually the same color. So if you don't believe me, I can show you afterwards on my computer but this is actually true. And again, just trying to challenge us to think a little bit deeper, to not always go with our first assumption or our first uh, thing that we perceive. So then we looked at overuse injuries to the shoulder. How do you screen these? How do you test them? How do you monitor these guys? So previous research has shown that about 40% of male and female volleyball players will have shoulder complaints at any given season. Of those, nearly half of them report that these symptoms interfere with their ability to play. Another study by Jacobson et al. found that 
people with shoulder problems typically had them for an average of just over three years, and that most of those players reported pain limits how hard they can spike, as well as pain hitting to all locations of the court. So whether they're hitting down the line, they're hitting cross court, they're getting pain with all of these different types of spikes. So this is something that not only is it prevalent, but it is affecting their ability to play. So it's certainly something we want to try to address if we can. So how could we screen it? What would this look like? So we know from previous research that similar to other sports, if you have previous shoulder problems or shoulder complaints in your shoulder, you're nine times more likely to have shoulder pain the upcoming season. We know that if you have decreased external rotation strength compared to your internal rotation strength, you're more likely to have shoulder problems. And if you have some sort of range of motion deficit, we know this from other overhead sports, baseball, handball, that if you have some sort of range of motion deficit, that you're also more likely to have shoulder problems. So this served the basis for our shoulder screen that we did. So first we had them fill out a quick four question questionnaire. Do you have any shoulder symptoms? What are those like at the moment? And then we did three things. So one, we looked at flexibility, so internal, external rotation, in a couple different positions. We looked at your strength, so again, internal, external rotation strength. And then we used a real-time ultrasound machine to look at three different things. One, we looked at humeral torsion. So those not familiar with overhead sports specifically, what you find is guys that do a lot of throwing or a lot of overhead sports as they're growing and as they're developing, they'll often get kind of a twist or a torsion in their upper arm bone, in their humerus. And that torsion actually means that as they become adults, you have more twist in one arm than you do the other arm. So we can actually measure this, and uh, you can actually then calculate that into the flexibility measures that you use. We also looked at neovascularization. So basically, do you have like a blood vessel growth into the supersonatus tendon um, in around that area? So we've seen that in other lower extremity things, the patellar tendon or the Achilles tendon. And then we wanted to look at the subacromial bursa. So those players that come in that have shoulder problems, in the clinic, we often see that, and we often say their bursa is swollen or it's inflamed, it's thickened. So we wanted to actually just measure the thickness of the semacromial bursa to see if that has any relationship to shoulder problems. So again, you may be familiar with this in the patellar tendon, the Achilles tendon. Um, but a recent review by one of our colleagues, Sean McAuliffe, found that tendon abnormalities in ultrasound are associated with future symptoms of both patellar and Achilles tendinopathy. Um, and they found that in, lo so obviously lower extremity things, but we often think, well, the shoulder's different. The upper extremity doesn't function anywhere near the lower extremity. So this may be true, but we just don't know. Nobody's looked at these things in athletes, in overhead athletes specifically. One study tried to look at this, and uh, they looked at the thickness of the bursa. However, they did use a group of athletes that were open water endurance swimmers. So these are guys that are training for an event that's 20 kilometers long. So this is, again, this is going to be very different than what we see in volleyball or baseball or tennis. Um, but what they did find is two interesting things. One, they found that the thickness of your bursa correlated with how much swimming you do. So there seems to be a load relationship. The more swimming you do, the thicker your bursa tends to be. They also found that those that had pain after this 20 kilometer event had a thickened bursa compared to the group that did not have pain. So it seems to be two things going on. One, there's a load relationship, but also those that have problem and have pain seems to be something there with the bursa thickness as well. But again, we don't know what this is like in other overhead sports, so we wanted to check this. And we also don't know this idea of neovessels and blood, blood vessel growth in the, into the tendon hasn't been looked at in athletes or overhead athletes. So we took six teams of ours, six volleyball teams here in Qatar. We followed them for a 12-week period. And then we had the players complete the questionnaires roughly every two weeks. And what ended up happening, so what are our results? You'll see kind of two groups here. So this is looking specifically at neovessel presence. And what you see is this first group on the left, about half the players develop shoulder complaints in the season, and half the players don't. So if we scan you at the start of the season, you have neovessels in your shoulder, you got about a 50-50 chance with our group of players. Again, it's not a real big cohort. We'd like to get this bigger, but it seems like maybe there's something there, especially when you compare it to this group on the right, where if you do not have ultrasound or uh, neovessels present, then most likely you're not going to go on to develop shoulder problems. So just if you look at this, you see this group does not necessarily look the same as this group. And again, we'd like to see this in a bigger number set, but it seems like maybe there's something there. So for me, doing my PhD, I've had to learn a lot along the way. So those of you that may not be familiar with like relative risk or risk ratios, where do these numbers come from? I'm just going to walk you through that. So these neovessels that we're talking about, 
I'll show you how it plays doing this two by two matrix. So if we know nothing else, if all we know we've got a group of volleyball players from Qatar, we know that of 59 of them that do not have any sort of problems, any sort of shoulder complaints at baseline at the start of the season, we know that about a quarter of them, 27%, are going to go on to develop shoulder problems. However, if we scan their shoulder, we look and see if they have neovessels, and they do, then their chance of having shoulder problems goes up to 54%. On the opposite, the group that does not have neovessels, you see that about one in five end up having shoulder problems. So we compare these, this relationship, you end up getting this risk ratio, you're 2.7 times more likely to develop shoulder complaints if you have this presence of neovessels. So that's kind of how we calculate that relative risk number. We did the same thing for the other areas. So looking at subacromial bursa thickness, if you have a bursa in your dominant arm, the one that you do all the hitting, that's 0.3 millimeters or more greater than your non-dominant arm, then again, so it's, it's thicker than the other group, you're 3.3 times more likely to have shoulder complaints. So initially it looks like maybe there's something to this. So it was easy for a while to kind of write off uh, ultrasound, neovessels, bursa thickness, I'm sure there's no relationship. But in our group, it seems like maybe there's something to this, so it might be worth investigating a little bit further. We also looked at a few other areas. So how does strength measure? How does flexibility measure? Well, shoulder strength, there's just no relationship with those that develop shoulder problems. In shoulder flexibility, the guys that did have pain and did have problems, they had about 12 degrees more external rotation compared to those that did not. So this was kind of a medium or moderate effect. Now this got me thinking, again, doing a PhD, thinking a little deeper, we could look at this and say, clearly, if we measure your strength at the start of the season, this has no relationship, so why even look at shoulder strength? Like, this is a waste of time. And you'd probably be somewhat true, somewhat accurate with that, but for me, I started digging at this and saying, these guys come in here, so they come into the hospital, we test them, we send them to physio, and physio, we test them, we measure their strength, they're not strong, we put them on a strength program, in a matter of weeks, these guys are stronger, they're feeling better, they're back to playing their sport. So in the clinic, it seems to make sense that sh like your shoulder strength should be related to what you do and how you feel and how you play. So for me and Thule, I would have thought that shoulder strength would show up as a factor here. But again, thinking a little deeper, of the different areas that we measured, my guess is shoulder strength is probably the one that's the most variable. So these other measures, things like your range of motion, it might change a little bit from day to day, but in general, it's gonna be pretty constant throughout the season. Shoulder strength, if anybody's ever think about it, if you've gone and you've done a hard weightlifting session or a hard aerobic session, so you start the session, you warm up, you feel great, you feel like I could produce a lot of force right now. By the end of the session, an hour, two hours later, you're exhausted and your ability to produce force has dropped significantly. So we know just intuitively that your strength can fluctuate just in a matter of one, two, three hours, and certainly from one day to the next day to the next, the shoulder strength just has to fluctuate quite a bit. So to do a one-off measure and then think that this is gonna be predictive of four weeks, eight weeks, 12 weeks down the line, it's probably not gonna be. There's gonna be too many other changes that are going on and we're probably not measuring the right thing. So. Intuitively, what might make sense and what might show us something is if we actually measure it more often. If we measure it every week or if we measure it every day, then we might actually start to see some sort of relationship. Love this quote here. It's sometimes good to be reminded of the basics. It's tough to make predictions. Very obvious, very clear. So where do we go from here? So this to me, I think, is the exciting part of what we're doing research, what we're doing clinically and with these players. Um, if you think about shoulders, how could we measure and how could we monitor the response to load and how could we do that throughout the season? So if I've lost you, hopefully I can bring you back in just for a minute that I think this is where the goal is, that I think this is the direction we're going and where we can start to see some really cool things. So what we've done with a number of our players, we've started measuring them and following them every week. So we look at things like shoulder strength, we look at shoulder flexibility, and then we have them fill out this quick four question questionnaire. And what we find is this whole process takes less than two minutes per athlete. So this isn't a time intensive thing, this isn't a big thing, you're not strapping them into a biodex and it takes 20 minutes to do one test. This is a really quick thing, you get a quick picture of this athlete and it doesn't take long. So if you've got a team of 10 to 15 guys, we're talking maybe 20 to 30 minutes a week, which if you're really busy might be tough to find that time and I get it, but I think if you can somehow carve out 20 minutes for yourself, I think you're gonna get some really interesting things that you can look at. So. 
just to take one example, we looked at this questionnaire and how could you use that throughout the season? So this is some volleyball results that we had from the first four weeks of the season. If we take one player here, what we see is this player's had a couple weeks off and he's come into the first week of the season and you see he's reporting here zero. He's got no complaints, he's feeling 100%. This, the questionnaire will go from zero to 100. 100 means you cannot play at all because your shoulder's in such bad shape. So this guy's feeling really good the first week. By the second week, he started to do more training. They've started to do two sessions a day and now you can see he's starting to have some shoulder problems. So this 51 is quite significant. We've put a red X there to let us know there's something going on here, try to dig into this. I know from looking at this guy's questionnaire that he's reported he's had to reduce his training volume and he's also reporting that these shoulder problems are affecting his performance, what he can do on the court. So this is where if you're a coach you might think, okay, I need to maybe start having him only do parts of the training. Maybe I pick what's most important and try to give him a little bit of a break so we're not overloading him. And as a physio, you might think, these guys do all the spiking, his shoulder, the muscles get tight. If I can dig in and do some things to loosen up the muscles in the back of his shoulder, all of a sudden he starts to feel better and he can do more as well. So you try to do some treatment, you try to manage him, and we see the next two weeks, while he still has some shoulder problems, they're much better and they're being managed well now. So this is really the idea of what you can do with some of the stuff with getting this regular feedback, these regular data sets that you can analyze and you can actually do interventions right away on these guys. So that's shoulders, but what might this look like for guys with knee problems? So we know that volleyball does a whole lot of jumping, probably more than most other sports. Um, so what would this look like? So again, similar to the shoulder, about 40% of volleyball players will have these jumpers knee problems or patellar tendinopathy problems. Previous stuff has shown that there is a relationship between your training volume, the amount of training you do, and those that have these jumpers and knee problems. So for every extra set of match play that you do, you get about a fourfold increase. And for every extra hour of volleyball training, you get nearly a twofold increase. So there's this training volume uh, relationship. However, recent study by Barr and Barr found that one hour of jump load is not the same for all players. So one guy can do very, few jumps and one guy can do a whole lot more and that's what they found. So following junior elite level players over one week, you'll see here on the slide that one player did as few as 50 jumps during that week and one player did over 600 jumps. So you get two guys on the same team doing the same training and clearly one jump or one hour is not the same for both of those players. So with technology, we've started the last few years using these vert devices. So you see there's a small little device you can put in your hand, you can put an elastic band and wear it around your waist. So that's what these girls are doing. These are a group of girls, club volleyball players. They've all got them. And if you look on the left side of the screen here, you'll see you're getting real-time feedback of how high each jump is. So that last girl jumped 30 inches. This one's 27 inches. There was 28 inches. So immediately, you're getting this real-time feedback of how high each jump is. And then this will be the last one here. So for a coach, for a coach, this gets really interesting. So not only can we count the number of jumps, but we can actually get real-time feedback throughout the training of how high you're actually jumping. But does this actually measure what we think it measures? So we went ahead and tested this with our players, with our professional guys. We found in terms of counting the number of jumps, this device is nearly perfect. It's over 99% accurate. However, when we go to measure jump height, what we found is that it has good to very good reliability across the different jumps. We did find that there's a minimal detectable change of about 10 centimeters. So for us, that would mean if you had one person jump 80 centimeters and then they jumped 70 centimeters, we could probably say that this jump of 80 is higher than the 71. However, if you get closer, if you get 77 centimeters, 75, we're probably not confident enough that those two jumps are different. There's too much potential measurement error. Um, but what's really strong about this is that we can now grade, that's a low effort jump, that's a medium jump, that's a high effort jump, so we can actually get feedback in every jump throughout the season as to calculate jump load. So we can actually figure out a good measure of on-court jump height, which is really helpful. And this is similar to some previous findings in junior level players. So I would say it's safe to use this device in uh, younger players, professional players, you've kind of got a range of players now that you can use this. So we had one of our teams use these devices and to have every player wear these devices throughout the entire season. I should say every player except for the Liberos. So if you know volleyball, there's one position that 
doesn't really do any significant jumping. They play defense, so we didn't have them wearing these devices. But over the season, we had over 129,000 jumps. This was collected over 142 team sessions. So this is training, this is match play. And we found, again, there's a large number of jumps that are performed, and it certainly depended a bit on the position. So you see here, setters did about 120 jumps per training session, compared to outside hitters who did about 60 jumps per session. So you start to immediately see a difference that, again, certain positions are doing more jumps than others. And additionally, because we can now measure the jump height, we found that opposite hitters do most of their jumps at these higher heights. So setters do a lot of jumps at low heights, opposites do them at the high heights. And again, if you're not familiar with volleyball, opposite hitters, these are kind of your go-to guys. These are the attacker that gets all the glory. These are the poster guys. And uh, so these are the Lionel Messi's, the Ronaldo's, the Michael Jordan's of volleyball. So these guys are doing most of the jumps at these high heights. So I'll show you this figure here. The top here, we've got training data. At the bottom, we've got match data. And from left to right, so you see here, this is how high they jump as a relation to their body, their maximum jump height. So jumps down here are jumps less than 20% of their maximum jump height. And jumps on the right are more than 90% of their maximum jump height. So if you look at the training data at the top, immediately one curve jumps out from all the other ones. So that's this one in red. These are the setters. And what we find is, you'll see, because the curve is shifted to the left, that most of the setters' jumps during training are done at these lower heights. So they do a whole lot of jumps. So they do one, two, three, four thousand jumps in each of these categories. So at 10%, 20, 30, 40% of jump height, they do a whole lot of jumps. Compared to during match play, again, this happens to be the opposites. So you see, again, their curve is a little bit different. Most of their jumps are at the right side, so they're doing more jumps at 70, 80, 90% of their maximum effort. And they're doing very few jumps at these lower heights. So they're doing a whole lot less jumps at, at low heights here. But probably the most interesting thing to me from this study wasn't all this stuff, which is useful, this kind of uh, variability. But what we found is there were large week-to-week -week changes in jump load. And not just for the team, but for specific individuals. So we found that in a majority of the weeks, 18 out of 28 weeks, included at least one player with a two-fold increase in jumps. So they doubled the number of jumps they did from one week to the next week. Additionally, this was true for every player. So every player had at least one week where they had a, a, a two-fold increase in jumps. So some of the previous recommendations from Tim Gabbett, it was some of the loading data, they've suggested not to have more than a 10% increase from one week to the next. And immediately you can see that these are guys doing a 100% increase. So this certainly becomes interesting to me in terms of potentially how does this relate to these guys that develop knee problems. So kind of in conclusion here, we know that training is not the same for all players. Like we can definitely say that. it's not just the same over one week, it's not the same over an entire season. So jump demands are high in volleyball. They do a lot of jumps. Because we now have data for the type of jumps, the height that they perform during training, during match play, we can now use this data to start to implement training programs that will really encourage them into what they need to do. So if you think about it, a training program for one guy doing a lot of jumps at low heights should be very different than a training program for somebody else who's doing max effort jumps. Additionally, and at the bottom here, again, this is my thing that's interesting, is that jump loads are highly variable from one week to the next. So a well-intended coach they may try to make sure they don't have spikes in jump load. However, they can only really control that typically for the team. It's hard to control it for every single individual. So to me, this stresses the need to monitor individuals, to have every player wearing one of these devices, so that we can actually be on the lookout for guys that maybe they were injured last week, so they missed a few sessions, or they modified their training so that they weren't doing a full number of jumps. And then all of a sudden, the next week, we put them into normal training, but that creates a spike in their workload. So we've got some interesting stuff. I will say there's still another project coming after this where we're starting to look at jump load and how it relates to injury complaints. So you just have to follow me and pay attention because that'll hopefully come out soon. Hopefully we'll get some more insight into this. Um, but it's been a pleasure. I enjoy you. Thank you for your time. And I do have to say there have been so many people that have been a part of this process the last few years. I know we always get these uh, obligatory thank you slides. But for me, it's truly the case. I've had so many guys in the clinic, and I see a few of you guys out there. 
um, that have been there in the trenches collecting data, meeting with me, talking about these ideas. So it's a big thank you and really this is just the pinnacle of so many other people and what they've contributed here. So thank you guys.